Okay, seniors, uh, let's try to tackle some more sonnets today. Today we want to look at particularly uh, Sir Philip Sidney's sonnets. And, you know, yesterday we talked about Petrarchan sonnets and the whole uh, setup where, you know, the ones we read before, uh, Spencer's sonnets followed a more, uh, I don't say traditional because they're both traditional, but a more Shakespearean uh, pattern where you had the four, uh, you had three stanzas or three quatrains, four, 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 and then a heroic couplet at the end, which is a little bit common, more common, I think, with most of the uh, poetry from the time period we're going to start getting into. But Petrarchan sonnets were also a big deal. Sorry, I'm looking at my beard on... Uh, Guys, those masks, man, let me tell you something. But you guys don't have to worry about it, but, uh, you know, it just dents my beard in. It's making it look awful. Nobody cares about that. Petrarchan sonnets. Uh, these follow that octave where you've got eight lines where you have kind of a situational problem presented in six at the end where it, you know, takes that problem or situation in a different direction. It's not always a solution. Um, in fact, neither of these really are. But uh, I like these uh, sonnets. I like them better than Spencer's, to be honest. So let's talk a little bit about them as we get into them. So we're going to be on page 259 for Sonnet 31. These are part of a sequence called Astrophel and Stella. Uh, it has, uh, I believe, 108 sonnets total, plus 11 other poems. They call them songs, if you look at uh, on the Internet. Uh, and they may be considered songs. I don't know. Um, but uh, sorry, this beard thing's going to bother me the entire time I'm, te I'm teaching. Um, so let's take a shot at these, uh, Sonnet 31, uh, we're gonna deal with a lot of the same type of things we saw yesterday. We're gonna see personification in both of these. And this one, we're gonna have the moon personified. In Sonnet 39, which is the next one, we're gonna see two things, sleep and despair both personified. They both deal with the concept of unrequited love. We talked about that's always an issue in uh, a lot of poetry from this time period. And even earlier, uh, we would see that quite frequently. So that's gonna be an element here. And um, I would say that these have a different feel than particularly Sonnet 35 from yesterday's uh, poems. Uh, but that being said, you know, they, they definitely still have some of the same, you know, feeling of, you know, a guy who's really obsessed with a girl and who doesn't seem to share those feelings. All right. All right. So let's look at Sonnet uh, 31. All right. And again, it, for the weirdness that looks on the camera, the book's right here. So that's what I'm looking down at. With how sad steps, O moon, thou climbest the skies, how silently and with how wan a face. What may it be that even in the heavenly place that busy archer his sharp arrows try, sharp, sharp arrows tries? Sure, if that long with love acquainted eyes can judge of love, thou feelest a lover's case. Um, I read it in thy looks, thy languished grace, to me that even that feel the like thy state descries. Sorry about stumbling a little. So that's our octave. That's our first eight. Um, the rhyme scheme here makes this a little weirder feeling when you're reading it. Um, it's let's see, it's A B B A A B B A, then C D C D. Uh, e, e. So there. It's a weird setup. Um, typically, when you do that, like the second and third lines rhyme and the first and fourth rhyme, it, it almost loses the rhyme, to be honest with you. So, anyway, that being said, let's talk about what he's seeing here. He's talking to the moon, and he's basically this is a guy who's in love with a girl who doesn't love him back. And he's basically asking the moon, uh, you know, do you, are you going through the same thing? Because he's looking at the fact that the moon's pale, the moon's rising slowly, it seems very languid in its movement. So he's thinking, hey, you know, maybe you and I have something in common. Uh, he says, if anyone knows what it's like, the moon knows. Um, he even makes an allusion. We told you allusions are key. He makes an allusion to Cupid in line four, where he says that busy archer, his sharp arrows trying. He's like asking, does even in the skies, when he says the heavens here, he doesn't mean heaven like uh, a religious heaven. He's talking about heaven as in the sky. He's like, does Cupid even shoot the arrows up there? So he's made a connection to the moon and that we're similar and uh, we're both uh, heartbroken, let's just say. So let's see the last part of this, the, the sestet, the six lines that end it. Then even a fellowship, O moon, tell me, is constant love deemed there but want of wit? Are beauties there as proud as here they be? Do they above love to be loved and yet those lovers scorn whom that love doth possess? Do they call virtue there ungrateful? Now, one of the key ways to know this is a Petrarchan sonnet is if you know you look at those last two lines. Are, do they are they standalone? And they're not. 
uh, you know, lines, line 14 is, but line 13 depends on line 12. So we know now that we're not in that heroic couplet territory. And the thing is, is that a lot of people look at this as, well, this is the same topic. It is the same overall topic. He's taking a different angle on it. The first part is, hey, here how the moon and I are similar. The sestet here is talking more about the situation he's asking, you know, um, is in in the heavens is you know the love the way i feel it. sorry there's gnats all in this room today um says is love the way i feel it uh considered as stupid then as it is here he talks about the women there are they as proud there are they as ungrateful there is love you know if if do women want to be loved yet when they are loved they decide to you know discard the person who loves them that's what he's asking uh at, as this ends okay so you can get that real Thick feeling of unrequited love like this guy's really upset so much so that he's just leaning on anyone to listen to him including the moon all right uh you know it's a pretty pretty sonnet i like it um now flipping over the page to 260 we're going to look at sonnet 39 and sonnet 39 is really interesting to me um one of the big things i push with that i think makes sonnets worthy of study is that what they do is they take something that's fairly simple because you got 14 lines, you can't really develop much, and they make it really clever, uh, and they say it a clever way, and that's what makes a sonnet good, in my opinion, is is there a level of cleverness to it, and we see that in Sonnet 39. Sonnet 31 has it to a point, you know, the dressing of the moon and things like that. Sonnet 39, though, also really, uh, I think, says something cleverly, and in fact, I gotta be honest with you guys, I really didn't catch it fully until this year. I've been teaching it for years now, I and mean, I got the overall, but the last couple of lines uh, I've kind of glossed over typically, but there's something really interesting there to study. So let's look at Sonnet 39. And again, we're going to set it up like I'm going to read the octave, then we'll talk about the sestet. We'll do them in two separate pieces because they're really two separate angles on a topic, okay? So, sorry. It says, Come sleep, O oh, sleep, the certain knot of peace, the baiting place of wit, the balm of woe, the poor man's wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge between the high and the low. With shield of proof, shield me from out of the priest of those fierce darts of despair that that despair at me doth throw. Oh, make in me those civil wars to cease. I will good tribute pay if thou do so. So he's talking to sleep, and again, knowing basic punctuation and things like that lets you know that. He does do something that I, I, I you know, usually tell people that the key to figuring out personification, if you're just not sure, is do we capitalize things that don't need to be capitalized? For example, line six, where despair is capitalized. He's obviously personifying it there. Sleep isn't capitalized. So, you know, a lot of my students who are very, you know, legalistic in the rules, I, I say, will uh, say, well, he's not personifying sleep because it's not capitalized. And I guess you can maybe go that route. I still feel like anytime you're addressing an inanimate object, you're personifying it, you're assuming it has ears to listen. So, um, but, you know, I see why some people might disagree there. So he's talking to sleep, and he, the first four lines are just really listing uh, synonyms for the concept of sleep. When he talks about the poor man's wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge between the high and the low, pointing to the fact that in sleep we're all, you know, we're able to leave behind our circumstances if only briefly. Uh, and that's, you know, a benefit. It's why he also calls it the balm of woe. It's the place where we can all escape from our day-to-day -day stuff, just for briefly, even if it's only a few hours. Um, and he then talks about it's, it's a place where he can hide from the darts that despair throws at him. You know, he can quit being sad. You know, he's pining over this girl still. I mean, we're only, if we're in the sonnet sequence, we're only eight sonnets later. So, I mean, obviously it hasn't gotten much better considering there's 108 of them. So, um, He's begging sleep. He says, if you please will let me go, I have a pleasant tribute or I have something for you to, you know, to thank you for this. Now, here's in lines, uh, what are we on, lines 9 through 14. He's going to kind of give you what that tribute is. And, of course, the first few things he lists are normal, okay? So we have, take thou of me smooth pillows, sweetest bed, a chamber deaf to noise and blind to light, a rose garland and a weary head. Now, those are normal. Those are things, you know, he's saying like a, a dark room, a uh, place without noise, a comfortable bed, a comfortable pillow. These are all things he's offering to sleep. But then he points out, and if these things as being thine by right, move not the heavy grace. He says, but these things which are yours naturally, if that's not enough, I have the, I have my ace in the hole here, per se. Uh, and this is the part that I find to be clever. Now, normally, guys, I would just wrap this up and have read it and talked about how here's what he's offering. And I would have missed these last few lines, but I kind of, it kind of clicked when I was teaching it this year. He says, uh, if 
If these things as being thine by right, move not thy heavy grace. Thou shalt in me, livelier than elsewhere, Stella's image see. And he says, okay, well, if that won't work for you, then I've got, I've got something great. When I'm asleep, I can dream about this girl, and you'll have the opportunity to see her. Again, that's what makes us feel like it's personifying sleep. It's clever. He's saying the great thing to entice sleep is that while he's asleep, he can dream about this girl, and, and sleep can share in his obsession, to be honest with you, which is kind of uh, – I would say it's definitely got a little bit of stalkerish vibe to it, but nothing like uh, Spencer's Sonnet 35 did. And I honestly think this is kind of a, a much more romantic and clever thing to say. Uh, it's an interesting spin on this idea. Okay, so two more sonnets for you to look at. Uh, again, Petrarch and sonnets, these are great examples. And we're going to be moving into, we're going to leave sonnets for a day. Um, Today, as I'm teaching, I'm actually filming yesterday's work today, but we're going to look at pastoral poetry. These are not sonnets, but um, they have a very big uh, role in writing at this time. And then on Friday, we'll move back into Shakespeare, uh, and we'll look at some Shakespearean sonnets, uh, which will be much more like the Spencerian sonnets we saw as far as structure. Okay? Uh, I know it feels like we're beating these to death with sonnets, but I really think that if we're going to teach poetry, this is where you want to start. I realize that the language is sometimes complex. But the structure is very, you know, easy to follow, and you know it's not trying to do too much. You've only got 14 lines. When you study some of these larger poems, there's a lot of things going on, and we don't want to overwhelm you as you're still learning how to progress through, uh, you know, difficult verse. You know, all right, guys. Well, thank you for uh, listening. Thank you for watching these videos. Uh, thank you for, you know taking some of your education into your own hands and trying to make sure that, you know, whether you were in class or whether you were, you're learning online, that you're, um, you're doing the work, not just trying to read and say, I got it done. So thank you for that. I appreciate that more than you know. So have a wonderful day, and I'll see you back for our pastoral poetry with one of my favorite poets, Christopher Marlowe, and another guy who you probably heard from history. So I'll tell you who that is in the next video. All right, guys, take care.